Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Garrett Schmidt. I am the managing editor for BBC Exhibit Hall, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's live webinar that is uh, hosted by Milliman Med Insights, and it is called Surviving and Thriving Under Persistent Movement to Value-Based Care Arrangements. Um, a few items of note before we get started, and I'll introduce our hosts in a moment. Uh, all attendants today have uh, joined in listen-only mode, so this is a traditional webinar format. You don't need to worry about muting your microphone or turning off your camera or anything like that. Uh, we can't see you or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. We are going to have a time for some Q&A towards the end. So if you have a question at any time during the presentation, uh, you can drop your question in. There's a little um, module that you have as an attendee, and there's a place for questions. So drop your question in there, and again, you don't have to wait until the Q&A to do so. And we're going to get to as many of those questions as we can during the Q&A today. Uh, and we're also going to have some polling questions throughout, so uh, so keep an eye out for those so we can get your engagement there. And at the very end, we're going to launch a little survey to see what you thought. Uh, so uh, next thing is the session today is being recorded. And what's going to happen is you're going to receive an email when we uh, when we finish, maybe about an hour afterwards. And it'll there'll be a link to the recording as well as to the slides for you to download. There's a, a lot on the slides today, so we don't expect you to read every little thing on them. Um, so you'll have those to reference later on. And uh, we hope that uh, you will be able to re review it and share it with your colleagues and friends uh, as needed. So without further ado, I uh, wanted to briefly introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Kate Fitch, and she's a principal and a healthcare consultant with Milliman and also Jonah Brulette, and he is Principal and Consulting Actuary. So I believe Kate's getting us kicked off, so welcome. Great, thanks Garrett. Um, good day everyone. It is great to be on this call with all of you today. Jonah and I really look forward to sharing a lot of the insights that we've gained over the last 13 years, working with many providers who are in value-based care arrangements. Um, ever since kicking off MSSP and Pioneer, bundled payments, uh, we've been in this space and we will be sharing um, a lot of what we've learned and hope we can give you all some action items to take away from this. Um, next. Uh, so quickly, we did our introductions. I'm going to briefly touch on this transition to value-based care, the history of it. Has it delivered on the promise that it's been set out to deliver? More importantly, and most importantly, we're going to focus on the levers for success as downside risk in these arrangements becomes a reality. Um, that's really the push. And then leave some time for question and answer. Uh, but first, I'd like to do a quick poll to really get a feel for who's in the audience today. Um, if you could just respond, health plan, Provider group, healthcare system, pay provider, or other. Okay, this is popping up on your screen, so you can go ahead and make your choice. Uh, we are having several polls today. They're all going to be anonymous, just so you know. So uh, feel free to share openly, and we're going to share the results here with you, so you can see that uh, momentarily. We still have a number of results kind of coming in, and we'll give it another ten seconds or so. We'll close it down. Okay, I think most of the results have come in, so I'm going to close it down in five, four, a couple more coming in, three, two, and one, and I will go ahead and end and share the results anymore. Okay, here we go. All right. Thanks, Kate, are you Garrett. able to see that? Yeah, it looks like uh, we have the winner is other, but the provider group healthcare system, which is, I know, who is mostly in uh, these value-based payment arrangements. Providers are coming more, more on the scene and, and some health plan. Thanks, guys. Moving on. Okay. I'm going to talk about this slow transition to value-based care. It has been slow when ACA kicked off in 2010 and then in 2011 in particular uh, when Pioneer was launched and the MSSP program in 2012, many programs, CMMI was established and has been putting out lots of different models over these years. I mean, to this year alone in 2024, 
we have Guide Ahead, Team, IBH, but we also have had this Primary Care First, uh, previously CPC Plus, then Primary Care First, and now Making Care Primary in 2023. Other programs which have tried to focus on hospital reduction programs, acquired infections, or conditions. So there's been so many different programs and models to try to get providers and payers on the same wavelength in terms of improving the quality of care and reducing the cost of care where it's possible, making care more efficient. So again, it's it's amazing that all the programs that have been put into place are not even on this timeline here, but we can see we've come a long way. We really have. And where are we now? If next slide. This is three graphs that are just trying to recap where are we now in value-based pay, pay or value-based payment um, landscape. These are depictions from LAN. So some of you are probably familiar with the Healthcare Payment Learning Action Network, LAN, which has been out nine years now, very highly regarded organization that does surveys every year of all health plans, as many as they can get. CMS is involved as well. And many health plan organizations that cover about 87% of covered lives, healthcare um, insurance covered lives. And so that very representative. What this is saying though, and what, what I really want to just highlight here, the upper left graph is 2022, the results from, the results in 2023 are not out yet, but what we see here is that about 25% of uh, lives are in these are in downside risk. The real movement from land in particular, and there are many um, members that are uh, members of land are trying to move to downside risk. I mean, that was something that came out recently again when CMMI was criticized for some of the programs and the defense is, well, until we move to downside risk, People can jump in and out of these programs. They don't have any skin in the game. And until we move to mandatory, again, jumping in and out. So the big push here is to move to downside risk, which is why we really want to talk to you about the successes that our clients have had um, moving to downside risk by implementing particular programs. Um, we can see on the right graph that there has been an increase in movement to downside risk. This, these bars are the different um, health plan types, traditional Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, commercial, um, but showing that there is a steady movement to downside risk, but it's still only not even at 25% overall. So that is, again, everybody is, the handwriting's on the wall, I think, and, and we all know it's coming. Um, the last graph on here is just showing the number of lives that are in accountable care arrangements, and that has been growing 36% overall, close to 50% in traditional Medicare and fee-for-service. We know with the MSSP program, the REACH program, so that that particular line of business has had more of an adoption of value-based care arrangements. Um, next slide. quickly to just get gain in the audience, um, do you participate in value-based care arrangements with any of the following programs currently? If you could just respond to that. All right, same deal as before. It should be up on your screen. And again, this is anonymous, um, but we'll show the results momentarily. And this is a choose all that apply. So you can choose multiple of them if need be. We've got yep. results still coming in, so we'll give it a few more seconds here. Of course, the choices are MSSP Reach or Reach, Medicare Advantage, commercial plans, Medicaid plans. Okay, I think we have most of the results in, so I'm going to give it another five long seconds, and then we'll close it down. Five, four. Three, a couple creeping in, two, 
and one. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and share the results now. Oh, boy. Okay, we had a couple come in right at the last second. All right, sit, uh, Kate, can you see that the results here? Thanks, Garrett. So we have a 49 close to 50. Good. So, yeah, we have close to 50% of the, of the participants responded, which is terrific. Medicare Advantage, that is shown. That is the where more than any other line of business, um, those value-based payment arrangements are, and many more people are adopting those. So that, that makes sense. MSSP and Reach is up there at 60%. Um, so, yep, looks like, but we're, st we're still not to where our next slide, which is where, where we all want to go, which LAN has, this again most recent um goal in mind which is in line with what cms has stated that by 2030 100 of fee-for-service lives are hoped to be in some value-based payment arrangements and what LAN is saying that they are saying that the goal is in downside risk, 100% 2030, 100% in downside risk, commercial 50%, Medicaid 50%. So these are, again, very aggressive goals. Um, and next slide. Do you believe that these 2030 goals are achievable? Yes or no? If you could respond All right you. it is up and yes or no one or the other <laughs> yeah. questions are <laughs> results are rolling in rolling in do you believe the land 2030 goals are achievable yes or no okay i think we have most of the responses in about ooh, about 60, Thanks, a little over 60 percent of the audience. So yep. I'm going to give it about five seconds okay. and I'll close it and down. And not a surprise, no. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, and one. And I'm going to share the results here so you should be able to see them. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, the results are not a surprise. 67 percent, no. They are not achieve, probably not achievable by 2030, but some people do think they are. So that's that's encouraging. Um, how, of course, what is going to move the dial to get these you know these goals met? Um, whether it's mandatory programs, whether it is mandating people to move to downside risk faster, we'll see. Next slide, though. Okay, so I just want to. Uh, reflect a little bit on whether or not all these 13 years of programs and so on have delivered on the promise. And this, I pulled up, I call it a, a blast from the past. One of my partners, Bruce Pines and I wrote this in uh, 2009. So that was 15 years ago. We, when healthcare costs were 16, 15% of GDP, and we truly believed and thought there could be get alignment on represented many different programs. And so we wrote this paper and we're very optimistic, which uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we where are we today? The projection for 2032, these numbers just came out last month, almost 20% of our GDP will be spent on healthcare. We're at 17.3% now. Now, that's not to say that all this cost is because people are not efficiently managing care. We know that there was a bump because 20 million more people were covered by healthcare insurance with ACA and the state exchanges. Medicaid, Medicaid also expanded on their federal poverty level, the requirement. So a lot more people covered, which is why the, a lot of this cost increase is from that. But it's also because of the trend in utilization, which is going up, has been going up, and unit cost. Um, and so 20%, we the national healthcare spending is expected to grow by almost 6% a year through 2032. 
So again, um, we, we've heard the statistics so many times that we spend more than any other country, almost twice as much as any other country in the world, and our results are no better. But I'm not here to talk about that. Next slide, please. Okay. I mean, there are some glimpses of positive outcomes. Um, and with commercial, these value-based payment arrangements usually talk about improving quality, improving chronic disease management, not so much cost reduction. CMS has reported with the REACH program savings and with the MSSP. In general, there has been a lot of criticism lately of CMMI and costing mandatory programs. We'll see where that leads. Next slide, please. Hey, Kate, I hate to interrupt, but uh, it's freezing up a little bit. I am wondering if we should take you off camera so that um, it maybe opens up a little bandwidth. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And while you do that, we've got another polling question here oh, okay. that I'm going to Sounds like put a plan. up on okay. the... Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Here we go. Do you believe value-based right. value -based care arrangements are delivering on the promise to improve healthcare quality and reduce costs? Not at all, somewhat, or mostly. Oh boy, the answers are flustering in. So we'll give folks another few seconds to answer here. Okay, I think it's slowed down and uh, we have about 60% of the audience that's voted. So if you have your choice, go ahead and put it in. I'm going to close it down in about five, four, three, two, and one. Oh, someone snuck in right at the end. Here we go. Okay, so somewhat, which is not a surprise again. Um, 13 years, many programs, it's, uh, people are feeling it, it isn't as successful as we had hoped, uh, but what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Jonah, who is going to talk about transformation, trying to deliver on this promise. What are some of the levers that we've seen our successful clients use? So Jonah, hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, great to be on. Yeah, so it, as Kate discussed, um, I think what that graph shows and what that data shows is we're at somewhat of an inflection point um, in value-based care. We've been here for a while. Um, certainly the in, uh, COVID, the unexpected um, interference of COVID delayed some of the, the move to downside risk and um, I think prolonged how long we've been at this stage, but we are starting to get communication um, whether the 2030 goal is strictly achievable, up for debate, but, but I think the... Um, the goals have been put out there uh, and we are seeing progression towards those goals, which is um, payment arrangements other than strictly fee for service, um, making up a majority, hope that in Medicare at least that now hopes for a, a large majority um, of how we pay for services in healthcare. Um, and we're starting to see that. And, and I think over the next 10 years, we'll likely see as this slide, uh, shows a move towards more dan downside risk, possibly more mandatory risk, um, just more um, momentum towards the things that we've seen over the last 10 years. So some characteristics to that to that point, what are the characteristics associated with high performing ACOs that we've seen? Um, duration in the program. So the longer someone has been in the program, the more success. There's some survivorship bias there, but also there is just understanding the program, understanding um, what needs to be done and creating a consistent uh, return on, on the uh, reimbursement model that's uh, been chosen there. Multiple VBC deals. Um, not all VBC contracts are the same. I think they're all attempting to do the same things, which are increase value, increase um, sustainability of healthcare. Uh, the more deals you're in, the more incentives are layered on top. It seems to... It, create a system that functions more efficiently, generates savings over time. Generally, when we talk about what is um, success in these programs, I think going back to uh, the graph that Kate showed is, is key. What we're looking to do is bend the trend. And, and that's what we've seen in most of these models. You get a trend and you're 
uh, and possibly a discount and your, the design is to come down below them. So really what we're talking about is not necessarily reducing the cost in absolute, but bending that cost curve down or flattening it out. Um, and then the other thing we've seen, uh, physician-led versus hospital-led, we have seen differential in ACO performance. Um, I, I think at the moment we're seeing um, some characteristics uh, of success, maybe around physician-led. Um, we can discuss some of the factors there. I, I think primary care focus has produced more savings in these programs to date. Um, and I think one of the next areas that I'll touch on in the coming slides will be the incorporation of more specialists uh, and how we accurately and, and adequately pay for them. Um, other factors that play into this, sufficient infrastructure, um, culture that emphasizes collaboration, so integrated care, integrated decision-making, um, and then strong management, again, administration on top of the ACO that is focusing um, on the broad goals of reducing costs across um, different service categories. We can go to the next slide. So we've summarized these key levers um, into six categories here that we put on this graph. And, and I, I think in some ways they go kind of from left to right um, in, in terms of what people focus on um, and sort of the, the most readily available. So the first level, and, and I would say right now, what we've seen in the programs to date is a heavy focus on the, the two left-sided features here. So procure high-performing providers and improve risk coding accuracy. Since the programs to date have not been largely mandatory um, and have been focused on primary care uh, attribution, what we're seeing right now is that a lot of good performance is, is getting the right providers into the program, providers that are benchmarked correctly, that make sense for the models that have been uh, put forward, um, and those that are already achieving um, good cost to risk ratio relative to say regional. So that's the regional adjustment you see in both REACH and MSSP. That's been a large driver of success. Are my providers already performing at an efficient level compared to the market at large? And can we, optim can we um, generate savings on maintaining that level of efficiency? Um, the other one is improving coding, risk coding accuracy. Outside of MA, we find that um, coding efficiency is, is probably not optimized in, in many populations. So um, bringing the coding level and accurately reflecting the underlying risk of patients has been a huge move that we've seen in generating sort of value in the initial phases of these programs. I think both of these, as you think about them, are likely to be less um, profitable in the future as they have been to date as the market gets more efficient, being, being already high performing becomes less valuable as everybody else catches up. Same thing goes with risk coding accuracy. As everybody gets better around risk coding and risk scores get renormalized, those initial returns um, may still produce profit, but won't produce as much um, and as much savings as we've seen in the early phases of the program. So what we're gonna see, we think, as we move deeper into um, value-based care is focus on the next four things. Um, manage inefficient utilization of medical services. This is probably the one that most of us think about um, and broadly is the poster child for what we're trying to achieve with value-based care is care transformation in some ways, doing the things we should be doing, not doing the things um, we shouldn't be doing and saving money as a result. Uh, Kate at the end of this is gonna go into uh, the various ways that we think about this. We've still view this in most value-based care arrangements um, and based on some of the slides that Kate showed earlier, I don't think we've optimized inefficient utilization of medical services, um, and I don't think the data suggests we have. So I think there's a lot of movement yet to be had there, um, and will likely be an area where um, high performers seek to um, achieve gains going forward into the future. Um, the other things that need to be done meet quality outcome thresholds. We've seen some work there. I think. Probably what we what we're likely to see is a continued involvement of what uh, a, a continued evolution of what quality outcome thresholds um, are set. So how we measure quality, what we actually want to be measuring, is it fair? Is it balanced? Are we um, are we rewarding the right things? Are we um, are we 
indicating too much um, underlying population characteristics that providers can't change. So I think some movement needs to happen there. Um, I would say right now, what we're seeing in the market is a lot of people are somewhat frustrated by meeting those. We are seeing people meet those, but the, the goals there are less clear than they could be. I think that'll be another area as efficient um, utilization becomes a focus. The What goes along with that politically and within the public sphere is we wanna make sure that quality of care is also high. Um, and in areas where perhaps we don't want to reduce utilization, um, introducing quality measures can give us another way to pay for value that isn't simply doing less. Um, so I think that'll be a, a, another huge issue. Um, and then manage leakage referrals. I think this pairs with inefficient utilization of medical services. As care is um, more compressed, as we're doing less of it or, or um, trying to coordinate care better, Theoretically, what we want to see is we want to see that care happening in more integrated systems, um, see providers referring to providers that they're partnered with, that have skin in the game along with them. So again, we haven't seen a huge amount of this. We are, we are seeing people manage and track this in, in the value-based care arrangements they're in, but I think we'll see an increased focus on that as we move forward. And then the final item here that I think is quite interesting and, and really we're at the very um, early stage of this is contract management. Um, what, are, what are the incentives in my contract? How do I optimize my contract terms and how I'm participating in these contracts to generate steady revenue? Not just um, one-time returns, but consistent returns. What is the process and administration I need around these value-based care arrangements to make sure that I'm generating sustainable and um, long-term revenue in the programs. And that comes down to a lot of actuarial concepts. We won't get into all of them here. We have other webinars and maybe you'll hear me uh, go on about that. Contract terms are hugely important. What we're incentivizing, how we're incentivizing it. Um, you'll hear things like the actuaries talk about attribution bias, how you are attributed patients and when you are attributed them can have a huge impact on whether you're successful or not and whether we're measuring what we wanna be measuring. Um, how we're doing risk adjustment, how we've structured the com, uh, contract to rely on either prospective HCC risk adjustment, possibly concurrent HCC risk adjustment, or some other form of risk adjustment, um, episode-based. Um, these are all really important concepts that I think we're gonna see a lot of growth in um, coming in, especially as we seek to engage, if we're gonna go towards 100%, even if we don't get there, if we're gonna go towards 100%, we need to engage specialists. And how do we engage specialists? Likely through more, more and different types of contracts than we're currently seeing in the market right now. So certainly like to see, we expect to see movement in there in the coming years. You can go to the next slide. And I'll go through these relatively quickly. Um, the first lever that we see is procuring high performing providers. One thing to just keep in mind about all these contracts um, that, that we enter into, generally as an ACO or as a risk taking entity, you're participating with a number of individual physicians. In most of these contracts, even though you have aggregate performance, um, a lot of you, the, the performance can be broken down by individual physician. And that's hugely important to understanding how your ACO is actually performing and whether you're optimized, again, for long-term success um, and consistent success. Um, this graphic is just something we use all the time. What it indicates is you have a very profitable ACO here, but underneath the ACO, you really have four of the providers performing quite well and six of them, um, and, and sorry, um, six, uh, can't count here, six of them providing performing quite well and four of them underperforming um, to some degree, uh, sometimes due to impact of regional adjustments. So they're starting off with less. Here we see physician three and physician six, both are starting with an, uh, a hit from impact of regional adjustments. So maybe they're not the most efficient to start with, um, but physician six, physician one are both overperforming that and still generating value while physician three is not generating value. Um, credibility comes into play here, and as actuaries, we we are very loath to necessarily say these are underperforming physicians that are doing something wrong. But it's good to be aware of this throughout the year and over multiple years to see if there's something that needs to be corrected here. Um, if there's some approach that needs to be modified, if the model that they're in is not suited to the patient group they're in, um, 
one thing we've seen is a, a lot of groups say they're an oncology group in Medicare fee for service. They might look like physician three, and, and there might not be really a great way for them to overcome the uh, inherent disadvantages of the of the baseline population that they're um, tasked with managing, just because costs move at a different level for them and, and all of those things. So specialists can be ill-suited for certain models. So it's good to have an understanding of how individual physicians or groups are um, contributing to the whole so that we can understand if a multi-phased approach, if a multi-model approach is best, if we need different solutions for different ways of participation. Um, I think as, as we, I sort of hinted at the end of that last slide, what we're likely going to see if as we move and if we move aggressively towards 100% under value-based care, that there's going to be many different models and subcapitations that get us there, not a single one-size-fits-all model that um, produces value for every single um, physician that participates. You know the next slide. And so that, that's really what people are doing right now. Um, I, I think the participation levels we see right now are around who's suited to these models um, and, and how well suited are they. And again, um, generally what we're looking for are KPIs. So not just overall profitability, that's view one, but also the KPIs. How are we performing in emergency room? Can we, can we create risk adjusted, consistent benchmarks across different groups that are participating and see who sticks out, who's underperforming, who's overperforming, what we would expect them to do based on the risk profile of their group? And then ask the question, is this something that they can address directly? Is this something we need to address with their participation choices? Do, do we need a different model for them or do we need to um, change something about our participation in order to make them successful? Um, so this is just one view of outpatient facility KPI that you can look at and, and see across your groups on a risk adjusted basis. What should I be spending on emergency room and what is each of my groups spending um, compared to a well-managed benchmark? You can go to the next slide. Um, the other area, and I, I said this is, both of these areas um, I don't think are fully optimized yet. So these are the areas we've seen the most movement in right now. Probably we'll continue to see a lot of movement and a lot of efficiency capture in these areas for the next several years. Um, the other area is improving risk coding accuracy. So how do I do that? I look for areas where I appear undercoded. Um, I look for patients that appear to have um, cost and risk out of line with the risk score that they're getting and some form of technology. This is one view that we often use, um, but it's looking at individual beneficiaries and looking for what's not there. Um, what has been coded in years prior that's not there? What has been coded that, uh, what drugs are they on? And are there conditions indicated by those drugs that we're not seeing in the data? Um, how do these beneficiaries, how does our coding level and cost level compare to regional benchmarks, national benchmarks? Um, MA benchmarks for the same lives. Uh, these are all really good questions to ask to get at the question of, are, is my population appropriately coded today? Um, and generally the answer to that question, at least outside of Medicare Advantage has been no, um, and continues to be no. Um, some are doing better than others, but there tends to be opportunity for better reflecting the underlying conditions within your population um, with more, um, accurate coding and that's very important to participation in these models uh, uh, there may be initial um, outsized uplift from getting to an efficient level but what that might indicate is that your initial benchmarks were also set abnormally low because um, in the past your beneficiaries haven't been coded as um, as morbidly as they are so um, I, I, this is another lever here that we're seeing people optimize. There's a lots of different ways to address this, but certainly we think if you're in a model um, and you're participating in risk, you have to have a sense and you need a sense of how efficiently coded, how optimally coded is my population today and where can I get to? Um, that's going to be a huge part of ongoing return in these programs. And keep in mind, the market in general is getting more efficient with coding. Almost every pro contract you're going to be in is going to have normalized risk or growth, which is risk or growth relative to a market basket of risk or growth. Because um, as I said, we are not efficiently coded by and large across any of these lines of businesses, maybe except for MA, and we still see growth in MA, um, but we see new risk models introduced, version 28. That, that introduces inefficiency in the market and the market will close those gaps as we see more and more people taking 
partner risk contracts, those gaps will close faster and you have to keep up with um, the general market movement to risk coding efficiency in order to maintain performance in yours. Otherwise you could be shown to have a decreasing normalized risk score, even as your absolute risk score maybe even slightly grows. This past year, if your risk score grew 2%, you would have actually realized a 2% normalized loss within Medicare um, fee-for-service um, if you were participating in an ACO because the national risk movement was 4% growth in risk score. So just something to keep in mind there. We can go to the next. Um, again, really quickly here, I kind of already spoke about it, but we do have quality outcome thresholds. It's really important to, to um, find some way to quantify those and track those at both the patient and the provider level to understand how they're, um, tr how you're tracking against those. I think we're gonna see a lot of development in this area uh, potentially. Um, and this may be longer term um, for specific specialties or areas, again, where we maybe we're not seeking so much utilization reduction, but quality improvement. Um, this may be a, a way that eventually that you are measured and your savings are adjudicated fully um, for certain specialists um, or certain episode types. So really important to analytically get a handle on how these are tracked and, and um, be able to understand what's going on there, where maybe the metrics aren't correct, or, or they're tracking against your expectations. I thought we were doing really good on HWR, but our, our data is saying something else. What's the cause of that? Um, and understanding that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, sort of the, the fourth lever we talked about was managing leakage and referrals. Again, a data problem. Um, what we need to do is we need to be able to view this. We need to view this at the service category level. Where am I, where are my patients receiving care? In almost all of these models that you're gonna enter into, there's gonna be some total cost of care um, element. And, and, and what I mean by that is you're gonna be um, at risk for care that is beyond what you simply provide. That's how, I, I think that's been made clear in these early um, models and where we've been today, actuarially, it makes a ton of sense as well. We do need some form of total cost of care. Um, the, the goal here is to make somebody um, accountable for all the care this patient might receive inside their office and outside their office um, or their facilities. So what it's in, what's important to understand is not just what care they're receiving, but where they're receiving this care, the pattern of how that care is progressing. So. Um, where are they where are they ending up in uh, for medical general admissions through an ambulance or not through an ambulance right maybe we expect that those that are happening without an ambulance claim are more are, are scheduled or more expected and we can do something about them same with facility inpatient surgery so again it's it's breaking down the detailed uh claims data into um chunks that can be analyzed and understood where are patients receiving care do i need them to be receiving care somewhere else to um, enact my care transformation plans that I have. And again, this is a data problem. Generally, as part of participation in any of these programs, you should be getting high quality total cost of care data for anyone you're attributed to and be able to, to run these analytics and understand um, how you're gonna reduce services overall, but maybe you'll end up increasing revenue amongst the providers that you um, are working with. Uh, so that there is um, both shared savings and possibly revenue replacement for the, uh, for the care that's being offset. In the next slide, um, just a few more details on this, and we can just go to the next slide, Sarah. But um, what this is, is just more detail. We can get into many levels of detail into leakage and to better understand what's going on there. Um, kind of the, the fifth lever, and this will be the final thing I'll talk about here um, for handing it back to Kate, would be contract management. So the idea here is that at the group level and at the contract level, you should have an understanding of how you're performing and why you're performing throughout the year. An, an important feedback loop in success in these programs and thriving in these programs is understanding throughout the year how you're tracking against and being able to adjust there wow, group two is losing money. Is there something we need to be doing there? Um, do we have the opportunity 
um, to look at coding there. If it's a concurrently coded risk contract, maybe we do and we need to do something better there because really what's happening is their benchmark isn't high enough for the acuity of patient. Or are they not managing the care in ways we expect? Is there some seasonality that we expect is at play here? Understanding what how you're tracking throughout the year and being able to make adjustments within year possibly, but also over multiple years. Um, I'm under, okay, groups two and seven here are not tracking very well. Do, are, is this the right model for them? Do they need to be in this model? Do we need to en engage them in some way, communicate this um, to them? Do we wanna gain share in some way, or at least um, show these groups how they're performing to enable them to change behaviors? Um, so again, all of those things, whether you wanna fully gain share or partially gain share, having a robust sort of analytical framework that tracks in real time how groups are performing against their benchmark in the given year and across multiple years, we find very important. The, high, the highly successful ACOs are looking at this um, monthly, quarterly, and making adjustments and planning for next year adjustments well in advance uh, of when they come through. And again, on most contracts, this can be done. It is a somewhat of a lift to get it set up and get it credible and make sure that you trust the results. But having trustworthy results at the group level, hugely important to maintaining um, high performance levels and creating that skin in the game that really uh, does drive success. We can go on to the next. Okay. Hey. All right. right. I, hope, I hope everyone can hear me. I apologize. There's some bad internet connection. Um, I'm going to talk about lever six, which is my, I am very passionate about. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the last mile. Jonah talked about the easier things. Yeah, risk coding. It's not easy, but um, making sure that you have the right providers. You can look at adding providers. Are they going to be efficient? Um, but actually managing utilization and implementing system changes is what's much bigger lift. And what every, all of you have some of data warehousing solution, some analytics solution. I'm showing you a view, which is what I call my treasure map. This is my starting point. And for those of you who have something like this or are interested in something like this, you know, happy to speak to you. But the claims data that you get is just such rich data. EMR data, very important. We integrate EMR data into our system, our BBC Insights. Um, but being able to, on a monthly basis, monitor the performance of your population by using, taking all the claims data that you get on a monthly basis from your MA plan or if it's an MSSP, your CCLF files, and grouping every claim to what we call a service category here, of which there's about 100 in our first column. So we group every single claim into a medical admission, surgical admissions, nursing home stay, home health, hospice, emergency room, et cetera. What's important about this is that we then quantify how much is your population using compared to our benchmarks. So this particular population, uh, the annual is a Medicare population here, is using medical admissions 100 per thousand people, but our benchmarks, that's the Milliman benchmarks, which are empirically developed using 100% Medicare data for this Medicare population. Again, we have MA benchmarks, we have Medicaid benchmarks, commercial, depending on your contract, but comparing your, perform your population's performance to the benchmarks gives an indication as to a, an initiative that you might want to further pursue and drill into. Now, the benchmarks are risk adjusted, absolutely critical. You cannot use our benchmarks if you don't risk adjust them to reflect the same risk as the population that's being examined. Um, so here, skilled nursing often is a big ticket item. Here it's 3.2% of total spend. It was, I'll tell you, back in 2018, it was like 7% of total spend, but people have really brought that down a lot. It's, it's usually 4 or 5%, still a lot of room there emergency room department this particular population has a higher rate than our benchmark um so this i always my clients we have working with about 70 acos whose data is loaded in here and they look at this every month and look at the trends and what can i do about it next slide please 
it's one thing to understand that you have opportunity, but then where this, what are you going to do about it? So this, this is just a high level view of where the opportunity exists. This population could reduce their total cost of care by 19%. It says if they move to well-managed is probably unlikely. Um, but it, it really highlights those service categories that have opportunity for reduction. If you want to do the heavy lifting of system change, provider profiling, patient management, et cetera. Next slide. So this is an inpatient medical admission drill down. So for an organization that had higher medical admissions than our benchmarks, they wanted to identify what, what DRGs are driving that. That's the first thing. Then what hospitals are driving it, what providers are driving it, what patients are driving that. So heart failure always pops out. We know that's a big ticket item. Heart failure admissions here, their annual admits per thousand of 10 compared to a benchmark, well-managed of 3.8. Lots of opportunity to reduce heart failure admissions, but how do you do that? One other drill down I often guide people to is, okay, well, let's look at our heart failure population and identify the higher risk heart, fa heart failure patients to then try to do some care management, more aggressive therapies, what have you. So you can drill down to the higher severity patients here. I've selected those who are have had a heart failure or related heart failure admission in the past 12 months. From there, I can look at that list of patients. I can look at their assigned providers to then really have an impact on who can we actually reach out to? What patients do we, do we wanna do some more aggressive care management or, or provider groups that need to be paying more attention to these folks? Next slide. Another big area, and again, this is Medicare, Medicare Advantage, there's opportunity in post-acute care, but not as much as fee-for-service. Commercial, post-acute care is not a big ticket item, but for Medicare, what, I, what we find with most of these populations is about 10% to 12% of total spend is just in the 30 days after patients are discharged. This does not include the admission that preceded the post-acute care. Okay, this 10%, can I do anything about it? Maybe I'm good, maybe I'm not. Here it shows that if this particular population moved to our well-managed post-acute care benchmarks, they could save 3.4% of total spend. But how do I find out what to do about that? Is there a particular DRGs that are driving that? Are there particular hospitals that are sending too many people to, to higher level post-acute care that could be a lower level. So here I've just highlighted uh, lower extremity arthroplasty, which we know is one of the highest volume surgical DRGs. And here the uh, admissions per thousand are higher than our benchmarks, but more importantly, uh, the actual post-acute care. We have, again, based on the 100% Medicare data, developed post-acute care per DRG, that is, what percent of patients after a lower extremity arthroplasty go to a SNF? What percent have a readmission? What percent have an acute rehab stay? So this is comparing this particular population's experience, actual, to our target. And you can see here that the inpatient readmission rate is higher, the skilled nursing facility rate is higher, the home health rate is higher uh, for this organization. So could you implement an initiative in hospitals that have higher post-acute care performance. And so then drilling down into the hospitals who have those cases, the 105 hip and knee surgeries, we can then profile which hospitals are sending more to skilled nursing, are sending more to acute rehab, and have data-driven decision-making and sharing with the hospitals to say, hey guys, we gotta, we gotta reduce this you are an outlier compared to these other hospitals. So again, what I really feel is just essential is using this rich data to drill, drill, drill. Get down to the culprit of 
who is responsible for the inefficient care or the higher than util higher utilization care than we would expect compared to our benchmarks. Um, next slide, please. One more drill down here. Uh, well, this is just, it's not only on post-acute care, the hospitals we like to profile, who's, who has higher post-acute care per DRG than others. When they get to post-acute care, what SNFs are more inefficient than others? Which SNFs do I want to uh, divert my patients to as opposed to the higher, higher um, efficiency SNFs? So we have, again, looking at by SNF, two metrics, average length of stay, and readmission rate back to hospital. We have risk-adjusted benchmarks for these. So what we, what we show in this particular view is each nursing home's average length of stay, which has been risk-adjusted to reflect the same underlying mix of patients coming to their nursing home. So it's, it's an apples to apples comparison. It's not, um, my patients are sicker and I have much older patients, et cetera. Same with the readmission rates. So again, just another way to address post-acute care by going to the nursing home profile or the hospital profile. So again, it's not, it's not always about the patient. People are really into care management. Care management is gonna solve all my problems. It's not just care management, it's system management. It is hospitals practice patterns that need to change many times. It's SNFs practice patterns. Next slide, please. One more drill down is um, here is just looking at infused injectable drugs that drives a lot of cost. 10, 12% of total spend is in part B drugs for Medicare. And this is just drilling down again. What, what are the drugs that are driving that cost? Ophthalmology is a big ticket item, particularly these two drugs which do have for macular degeneration that do have a substitute of vast and could be used. We've seen uh, ACOs who have convince their docs to give a Vastin and make them whole on what they would have gotten with their 6% plus AWP. So lots of different tactics that can be used to try to move the dial on inefficient utilization and reduce cost. The last slide, just quickly to wrap up and then I wanna to get to questions. Um, we, you know, we're really at a crossroads in this movement to value-based care and this downside risk is coming uh, it's, it's not going away from what we've all seen. And really now is the time to make those needed investments and commitments for successful transformation. So thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Garrett for questions. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we do have some audience questions um, to get to. So in no particular order, uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and jump in here. Uh, first is, uh, what is the role of SDOH in risk management? I'm a broad one. Okay, so SDOH, social determinants of health, um, what the biggest risk adjuster that we use is dual eligibility in the Medicare population, because that is a really good proxy for income level and, and such. We don't typically get much, we, do you, we, we don't necessarily use race, um, but that dual eligibility is a big, factor. Other social determinants of health variables you know, are not available in claims data, but they are very important. I would not uh, disagree with that at all. Gotcha. Uh, next question here is, uh, how do you track throughout the year with six month delayed claims? Or are you talking about clinical yeah. data? No, we're talking about all, all of the views that we've shown is with claims data. We do, our product does allow integration of electronic medical record data, particularly for quality outcomes, lab, radiology, and such. But this, the delay is an issue. Again, what I always say, this is a retrospective view. Your claims data is retrospective. It is to identify patterns in care that may need to be changed. It's not real-time identification of patients. It is identification of patient cohorts, like the heart failure population um, that could be identified but again, it's not one of these, oh, my patient was just admitted to the hospital. We're not going to see that, obviously. What we're seeing is patterns in care. And it's three months, you know, we get the data 
a couple of months after it's it's been adjudicated and we always want three months of run out for it to be credible. So it is a retrospective. Um, again, we always say you should be marrying that with your electronic medical records data um, for that real-time care management identification. Okay. Next question here, we're just rushing along because we're almost at the top of the hour here, is uh, what's the solution to setting future ACO benchmarks without punishing existing ACOs for prior savings? Yeah, that is a great question, and I, and I will let Jonah, I mean, that's always the race to the bottom. I mean, how, how can we keep setting a benchmark when we've done this great job and now we have to keep beating it and beating it? I mean, there is a threshold. We can only get so low, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is built into a lot of the reconciliation uh, formulas and all. And Joan, I don't know if you, you want to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, I'll just, I think you answered. Yeah, yeah, it is a concern. I would say notably in the Medicare fee-for-service models, there has always been this regional blend component, um, which seeks to, um, and, and there now is a prior savings adjustment that's also built in. Um, and the idea there is to recognize existing efficiency. Right now that works because the market is inefficient. As the market gets more efficient, um, there will be continued conversations around that. But I think some form of prior savings adjustment that we've seen in MSSP, reintroduced in MSSP, is probably the solution there. Um, recognize that over time it is going to move towards a more efficient benchmark and um, give ACOs long agreement periods. So um, you know, five-year agreement periods on the same benchmark is a good way to do this. Again, MSSP, I think Medicare is leading the way there. So there are actuarial concepts that can be layered in. And then I think over time, what we may see is uh, similar to what we saw uh, CMS do with the physician fee schedule, offer basically, if you can remain neutral in the program, there might be other carrots to being at risk, right? You're at risk, so you're not going to slide backwards. Um, but maybe you're getting a payment increase from being at meaningful downside risk. So I think that would be another way to reflect it in the in the maybe the far future would be incentives to be at downside risk, but not necessarily a requirement to meet your operating expenses with shared savings every single year. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, unfortunately, uh, we do have a number of other questions that came in, but we are out of time. But don't worry, uh, someone is going to reach out to you to answer your question. So if you have one that's burning, go ahead and drop it in now uh, and, and someone will get back to you with that. And uh, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Jonah. Thank you, Kate, for a, a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for bearing with us uh, through some, uh, some technical issues and some sound issues. I know that with the hurricanes and everything going on and, and uh, hope any of you that are caught up in that uh, are, are doing okay. Um, as we close out, I uh, wanted to encourage you all to head over to vbcexhibithall.com and check out the uh, Milliman Med Insight exhibit booth there. There's a virtual booth that, uh, and, and the slide will have a, a direct link to it, and you can check that out. There's a lot of cool resources there. You can read up on what they're doing and, of course, connect with their team there if you would like. Uh, and there's a lot of great resources also in the reference library uh, at vbcexhibithall.com, including that's where we're going to be archiving this webinar. So if you would like to uh, see that again or reference that or share it, uh, you can find it there. But we'll also be sending a link to the recording and as well as uh, to the slides for download here uh, afterwards. And then finally, if you would like to reach out to the Milliman team, um, you can do so here. Their uh, information is on the slide. And again, this will be in the slides that you can download uh, when we send you the link later on today. But I wanted to thank you again all so much for, for joining us, spending your afternoon with us. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jonah, for a fantastic presentation. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye now.